I'm a clinical diabetologist. Diabetes is decided upon as a disease with small vessel complications. So the numbers we choose are the ones that give us retinopathy, nephropathy, foot problems. And of course, intensive control of glycemia prevents that. It stops my patients going blind and their feet dropping off. So yes, beneath that, pre-diabetes has an excess cardiovascular risk, but we choose not to call that diabetes. Not that it's not important, not that we shouldn't intervene, but we have chosen the threshold for diabetes based on the small vessel complications. Now, I've got a very focused presentation on new therapies for diabetes. And particularly, I'm going to be looking at the cardiovascular outcome trials. And then after the coffee break, Kevin is going to look at some of the clinical prescribing issues that arise from the newer therapies. Now, we've been asked to give our declarations, and these are my declarations. And I haven't lost my mind here. You see AstraZeneca's there three times. <laughs> we were also asked to put the slide up and give you some chance to absorb it. So I want you to think, why have I put these things up there? Just have a wee think about why. OK, there's my declarations. So before we go to newer drugs, what are the older drugs? And of course, age depends a wee bit on the person giving the presentation. Uh, metformin is as old as I am. So it's been around in clinical practice for as long as I've been on this earth. Um, and it did have some cardiac benefit in the small subgroup of overweight patients in UK PDAs. Sulfonylurea has always been around the same length of time. It seemed to be safety in the UK PDAs, but no clear benefit during the trial. Similarly, those went, who went straight on to basal insulin in the UK PDAs had no cardiac benefit. And then much later, the Origin trial, which was a Glargine trial looking at people with early diabetes or pre-diabetes, gave them insulin or not, had no cardiac benefit. And then the glitazones, which we've heard a bit about already. In the proactive trial, which at the time was fairly controversial, there was a reduction in what they called MACE. And then, of course, with rosiglitazone, there was an enormous controversy, which I would suggest is still not settled, but whether it may be increased non-fatal myocardial infarction. <laughs> The one thing that the rosiglitazone controversy did do was change the way new therapies for diabetes are licensed. The FDA had data which might have suggested an increase in myocardial infarction, but nevertheless went ahead and approved the drug for clinical use. So the, the whole controversy then led to a, a complete change in the way you develop a new diabetes therapy. In the past, you would look at glycemic effects in your well-controlled, you know, your average but not morbid patient with diabetes. So middle-aged, no comorbidities. You might, up to six months, give them the new diabetes therapy and your outcome would be entirely being glycemic. So with the, new, the change in emphasis, first of all, when you're studying the sugar-lowering effects, you had to have a much more broad population, so older patients, patients with existing cardiovascular disease, patients with CKD. Any cardiac outcomes during that, when you're studying it for sugar, were blindly adjudicated. So you don't just say, yeah, maybe it was a heart attack. You identify in great detail. And then secondly, and the focus of my presentation, at some point in the development of the drug, you do a dedicated randomized control trial, a cardiovascular outcome trial. The majority of these are placebo controlled. Some have an active comparator. Now, there are lots and lots of these trials, and it can sometimes seem a bit overwhelming. But I'm going to distill it down and keep it simple for you, because it's quite easy if we address it with regards to the three new classes of drugs. So firstly, we'll look at DPP-4 inhibitors. And that's above the line here, because these were the first trials that we got. So the first two trials came out, actually present, presented at the same meeting and at the same time in the New England Journal. And actually, that's the most recent one we've had as well. The Carolina trial was presented just a couple of months ago. So just a brief reminder, the DPP4 inhibitors inhibit DPP4. That allows you to have more GLP-1 and GIP, which partially overcomes the incretin deficit that occurs in type 2 diabetes. So it's a physiological approach. It's glucose-mediated, so you increase insulin, and suppress glucagon. Now, in Scotland, we have sign guidelines. Sign guidelines were updated two years ago to reflect the results of the trials. 
Most of you, I think, practice in England or maybe in Wales. You have nice guidelines. Nice guidelines are not fit for purpose and should have been binned. <laughs> <coughs> they are currently being updated, but it'll be two years probably before we get the results. So nice guidelines, I've said my bit. <laughs> Kevin's going to come back to guidelines with regard to what they contain, but for this, I've taken data that summarises each of the three drug classes that I'll be talking about. So DPP-4 inhibitors are low to moderate at best. They have no cardiac benefits, and I'll show you in detail. They have a low hypoglycemia risk. They're weight neutral, few adverse events, so very easily tolerated. And four out of five are renally excreted, so with CKD, you have to reduce the dose. Now, we show of hands who regularly uses DPP-4 inhibitors in your diabetes practice. Right. I want you all to, next time you see a patient on a DPP-4, next time you reach your, for your prescription pad to start or continue DPP-4, ask yourself, is this the best for my patient? Or even ask the patient, because there are drugs that are not that strong, don't make you lose weight and have no cardiac benefits. The majority of your patients are overweight or obese, are dying to lose weight, maybe literally, as Michael tells us later. But metaphorically, we'd love to lose weight and you're denying them a drug that could potentially do that. Because DPP-4 inhibitors are yesterday's drugs. We'll be talking about them soon as older drugs. So this are the, or these are the cardiovascular outcome trials. You don't need to know the names. Four out of the five drugs have had cardiac outcome trials. Vildagliptin didn't go for one because it already had a European license. So rather unusually, with linagliptin, we got two for the price of one, a placebo-controlled one and a self urea controlled one. Now, with rosiglitazone, the controversy was around MACE atherosclerotic events. So the outcome is an atherosclerotic composite, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. And in none of these trials was there any benefit. They all showed neutrality, so they were safe, non-inferior, but no superiority. And then with regards to heart failure hospitalisation, which is a secondary outcome, but it's becoming a much more important outcome in diabetes. In the first trial, there was actually an increase in hospitalisation for heart failure. And in the allogliptin trial, in a subgroup, there was also an increase. So DPP-4 inhibitors, we should now be consigning to the bin, consigning to history except for a small number of patients. Also, absolute minimal renal benefits. Very, very slight effects in some of the trials on albuminuria, but nothing um, overwhelming. So that's the DPP4s. We'll now look at the SGLT2 inhibitors because that's really where things start to come in the treatment algorithm because these also are oral medications. We all filter glucose. A non-diabetic person reabsorbs it. The mechanism is SGLT2, 90% in the proximal convoluted tubules. 10% is SGLT1. These drugs do what they say in the tin. They inhibit SGLT2, so you have glycosuria. So it inhibits SGLT2, which is a transporter. It's not a receptor, it's a transporter. So you force glycosuria. By forcing glycosuria, you reduce HbO1c. You also lose calories, although not forever. So you lose weight, and then blood pressure falls as well. Partly this is because you're flushing out sodium, but actually, it's probably a much more complex hemodynamic effect that we're only starting to learn about. Now, right now, prescribing advice for the class of drugs is we should be using them as a therapy for people with type 2 diabetes who haven't reached the agreed target. <coughs> now, as I'll show you briefly in a couple of slides' time, this will change. So this is going to get an extremely confusing area because we're going to see a rapid widening of the clinical indications for the drugs. But right now, it's a diabetes therapy. So the sign says moderately effective, CV benefit in the three that have been studied so far, low hypo risk, weight loss, major adverse effect, genital mycotic, and Kevin, after the break, will go into the side effects of the therapies in, in more detail. And then currently, if your EGFR is below 60, you do not initiate them. Because the class of drugs works through a renal mechanism, if you have CKD, they are less effective at reducing your HbO1c. And the trial that really changed the landscape was the famous Emperage outcome trial. Empagliflozin was the third SGLT2 
inhibitor to market, but the first one that got results. So MACE was highly significantly reduced. It was driven by reductions in cardiovascular death because cardiovascular death is such a common cause of death. By reducing that, you reduce all-cause mortality. And then perhaps the icing on the diabetes cake, as it were, you also reduce hospitalization for heart failure. So if we summarize the three diabetes outcome trials that we have with regard to cardiac outcome trials, I've shown you Emperage outcome. The trial with canagliflozin was called CANVAS, a slightly unusual study, it was a CANVAS program because it included two studies at very different durations. That trial showed a reduction in MACE, a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure as a secondary outcome, but also showed an increase in fractures and amputations. And again, Kevin will talk a little bit more about potential side effects. The dipagliflozin trial was slightly different. The majority of people who recruited did not have established atherosclerotic disease, whereas for that it was 100% and that was about 60%. It was also a bit unusual because it went for co-primary endpoints. So one co-primary endpoint was the heart failure one of reduced CV death plus heart failure hospitalization, highly significantly reduced. MACE overall was not reduced, but if you look at a subgroup with prior MI, that was reduced. So as a class, for the three drugs that we have data on, it looks like if you've got existing atherosclerotic disease, SGLT2s will reduce future atherosclerotic events, but across the population, whether it's high risk or established, you'll reduce heart failure. Now, there are some information on renal composites. These are reduced. And when you look at it in detail, it's particularly, it seems to be the EJFR that's affected. So it's affecting renal function, which we'll come back to just shortly. I said this is a very busy area, so we get new information every year, and there's more of what to come. So first of all, there are two more diabetes cardiovascular outcome trials. Ertugliflozin is the fourth drug to market. Its trial is called Vertus CV, and it's due some point next year. I think it actually stops recruiting almost, or stops collecting data now, so data collection should be finished now, and it'll be presented presumably a cardiac or diabetes meeting next year. Sotagliflozin is an SGLT1 plus SGLT2 inhibitor. It was a Sanofi drug for a while, but it is no longer. Their outcome trial is called SCORED, and we're going to have to wait a bit longer for that. And then, not cardiac outcome trials, but other outcome trials in the heart failure arena and in the diabetes kidney disease, or CKD, are also going on. So Credence was a diabetes kidney disease outcome trial taking people with established diabetic kidney disease, low EGFR and or proteinuria, and a renal outcome, and the primary composite outcome was reduced by 30%. So this is a highly significant reduction in this study. It's canagliflozin versus placebo. Now these were all people with diabetic kidney disease. In the United States, the label has already changed. In Europe, we'll need to wait. But you will find your renal docs starting to use this, if not already, in patients with diabetic kidney disease. Now, obviously, if you're studying diabetic kidney disease, your EGFR is going to be below 60 in some people. And in America, the license has changed to use canagliflozin down to an EGFR of 30. That's not the case in Europe yet. And who knows who will be licensing us once we have Brexit or if we get Brexit. There we go. So you'll find your renal docs already using this off-label. You'll also find your cardiologist using dapagliflozin off-label for heart failure. So based on the observations of heart failure reductions in people with diabetes and Emperage outcome, this heart failure trial was set up by John McMurray, colleague of mine in Glasgow, and others internationally. So these were all people with well-characterized heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Importantly, 60% did not have diabetes. So this was not primarily a diabetes trial. This is the primary outcome, which is cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, which you've seen already in a previous trial. And again, this is highly statistically significantly reduced. And other composite outcomes were also reduced, cardiovascular death, in the United States, the FDA is fast-tracking the analysis of this study to see if this will become a heart failure treatment for people with reduced ejection fraction. 
Again, in Europe, it's been submitted for licensing. It'll take longer in Europe. But again, some of your cardiologists, because these data are in the public domain, it's been presented actually at now three, uh, two cardiac meetings and a diabetes meeting. The New England Journal hard copy was in the, uh, in the print last week. So people know the results. Cardiologists are starting to use it. And there will be safety issues because to start with, perhaps inappropriate patients will be, and so there's risk of hypoglycemia in some diabetic patients, risk of ketoacidosis in some diabetic patients. So finally, the third group of drugs that was studied in detail using the new approach are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Now this is another way of getting past the deficient in creatinine response in people with type 2 diabetes. It's using analogues, it's peptides of adjustment, so they're more resistant to DPP4, but also things are added to them so they'll act much longer. And if DPP4 inhibitors are decaf, these can be considered as a double espresso therapy. So they increase glucose-mediated insulin secretion, suppress glucagon, they also suppress satiety. They seem to cross the blood-brain barrier, suppress satiety, they also have effects on gastric empty. And in fact, one of them, loraglutide, in a stronger formulation in Europe is approved in non-diabetic people for obesity. So science says that they're highly effective. Specific agents of cardiac benefit, as I'll show you in a table, it's a bit more piecemeal, the, bit, the, the positivity. Some clearly beneficial, some not so clearly. See, SGLT2s, the data is, uh, looks almost like a class effect, but not for GLPs. You, yes, you get weight loss. Main problem in clinical practice, and we use these drugs a lot, is people can't tolerate it because of vomiting. Most folk get nausea, but some folk vomit and just can't get over that. So about one in 10 people don't continue with the therapy beyond a few months. So it's very much a trial of therapy. Will you be able to take it? And secondly, will you respond? Any therapy for diabetes that we start, between three and six months, we want to assess to see if it's worked. Because if it's not worked, we'll stop it. And that's true of old therapies. It's true of DPP4. It's true of SGLT2s as well. And we're getting, because these drugs are not affected by renal function, we're seeing accruing data about using them in lower EGFRs. So the first trial that came out, and I'll show you just as an example, with the GLP-1 that was positive was the leader trial. So the primary outcome, remember, is MACE is reduced. It's powered by reductions in cardiovascular death. Because cardiovascular death is a common cause of death, total mortality is reduced. But here, no significant effect on heart failure. So a different pattern of benefit to that seen with SGLT2s. No heart failure benefit. And secondly, a very slow separation here. Whereas with SGLT2s, it seemed to be quite an immediate separation. So cardiologists analyzing the pattern response, and in fact, in the discussion in this paper, it said, this is probably affecting progression of atherosclerosis, whereas SGLT2s, it's probably in some way hemodynamically mediated, although there are lots of other hypotheses as well. So say a bit more varied results. I'm showing you the drugs that we have in clinical practice. The one with lixicenotide showed no benefit. So largely that drug's been abandoned. Leader showed the results have shown. Exanotide once weekly using the old injection device um, didn't give consistent benefits. Semaglutide, which is a once weekly uh, in the SUSTAIN-6 trial showed reduced MACE and particularly seemed to be driven by strokes. And then the most recent trial is Lilly's once weekly called dualaglutide. Again, different from these other trials because this predominantly was people who were at risk rather than existing atherosclerotic disease. So it widens the type of patient that we see benefit in. Again, reduced MACE and strokes, but again, heart failure in utero. Now with this... In the dualaglutide trial and in the loraglutide trial, there were reductions in albuminuria, but to date, no clear effects in EGFR. So again, a different pattern from SGLT2s. So this is my final slide with my take-home messages. The DPP4 inhibitors will make mace neutral. Some may increase hospitalization for heart failure and pretty minor effects on renal function. The SGLT2 inhibitors reduce mace 
reduced hospitalisation for heart failure in people with diabetes and now in people with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and in the one that was studied in people with diabetes so far reduced progression of diabetic kidney disease but similar data subgroup analysis from the CVOTs. The GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce MACE, especially strokes, with minor effects on heart failure hospitalisation, and they reduce albuminuria and EGFR. And finally, just as I've said, different patterns of benefit, SGLT2s and GLP with regard to the time course, heart failure hospitalisations and EGFR. So the final question then would be, would we get extra benefit from combining the two? We know that metabolically we'll get extra benefit in terms of further reductions in HbO1c and reductions in weight, because that's the studies that have been done. We will not have a dedicated outcome trial comparing the two, and we need to look at real-world data to see if we get double cardiovascular benefit combining the two drugs. And finally, just as reminders, what we started with, it's more than just sugar. This thing is LDL cholesterol, it's not a fried egg. Um, that's blood pressure, and then also remembering cigarette smoke. And these are things, it's multi-risk factor intervention. What I've shown you is now when we're thinking about glycemic, there are drugs that, in addition to dropping your sugar, have additional cardiovascular benefits. Thank you. Thank you.